Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. And thank you for joining today's panel discussion on navigating competing interests in healthcare, co sponsored by the CU Center for Bioethics and Humanities and the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program at the CU Denver Business School. The program today on competing interests in healthcare is part of our university's unique program exploring the long term legacies of health professional involvement in the Holocaust. And you might well be wondering what is the connection to uh, a program on competing interests today. So I wanna be very clear, um, the program today is not to imply in any way that uh, competing interests in healthcare today are comparable or the same as um, Nazi ethics. Um, it has unfortunately become sort of a sickening trope to compare any kind of law or regulation related to medical practice to the Nazis these days. Um, and at the same time, we cannot uh, be misled into thinking the experience of medical professionals during the Holocaust has nothing to teach us because they were monsters and we're not monsters and our problems are different um, than what they evinced. Uh, our task at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities is to explore some of these most difficult issues and this most difficult history to learn from. Um, undoubtedly, you know that German physicians of the Nazi era accepted an ethics that said they should always prioritize the health of the Volk, uh, which they essentially thought of as the pure German race. And I'm putting all of that in scare quotes. And they were to prioritize the Volk over the well being of their individual patients, especially if those patients were deemed to be unfit or undesirable. Uh, uh, at the Nuremberg Doctors' Trial, Karl Brandt, uh, who was Hitler's personal physician and the chief defendant at the trial, said, uh, and I'm quoting here We German physicians look upon the state as an individual to whom we owe prime, we owe prime obedience. We therefore do not hesitate to destroy an aggregate of, for instance, a trillion cells in the form of a number of individual human beings, if we believe they are harmful to the total organism, the state. And the eventual result of this singular focus on serving as an agent of the state was the greatest mass murder in human history. And over the last 75 years, one important response to this history in healthcare has been to focus our ethics very closely on the responsibilities we have to our individual patients. At the same time, the pressure to also attend to the needs of the community, to employers, even to ourselves and our families, these tensions of competing loyalties within the life of the healthcare practitioner have not gone away and they never will because human health and well-being are inherently both individual and social. So what we're doing now is trying to learn to navigate these tensions of competing responsibilities. And it is thus part of our charge to learn from the lessons of the Holocaust. So our program today is going to engage leaders in healthcare, in business, and in medicine to explore these tensions, and in particular, to consider ways to balance our priorities and protect patients from becoming devalued in the pursuit of business success. So I'm going to turn over to uh, Ira Selkowitz. Uh, Dr. Selkowitz is the director of the Business School's Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program and he is a senior instructor in business law and ethics at the CU Denver Business School. Ira. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, I just wanna talk very briefly about the, what the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program is and who it's named for. The namesake of the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program is Bill Daniels, who was a pioneer in the cable television industry as well as a sports team owner. His success in business was due in no small part to his ethical business practices based on eight ethical principles. I'm now going to share my screen so that you may see uh, these principles. And they are integrity, trust, accountability, 
transparency, fairness, respect, following the rule of law, and ensuring viability for all relevant stakeholders. And in this discussion today, we'll be looking at who the stakeholders are in healthcare and how their viability, their long-term viability can be preserved. When Bill passed away, his estate went to the Daniels Fund, a private charitable foundation that he had established. One of the programs of the Daniels Fund uh, of the Daniels Fund is the Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program, which provides grants to instill principle-based ethics education at the collegiate level in the four state region of Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. The Daniels Fund Ethics Initiative Collegiate Program is comprised of 12 universities, 11 business schools, and one law school and in this four state region. And a major goal of the ethics initiative is outreach to the business community and this program is an example of just such outreach. So uh, Juan, looking forward to the program and thank you for attending. Hi, I'm, I'm Lisa Barrow. I'm gonna be moderating your program today. I'm a professor uh, of medicine and public health here at the Center. Uh, for bioethics, and I'm a scientific uh, chief scientist at the center uh, as well, and uh, quite an expert on conflicts of interest, which is linked to our topic here today on competing interests. So I'm really looking forward to moderating this uh, conversation about how we're going to navigate our responsibilities in healthcare to the individual patients, employers, even ourselves. And I just first want to briefly introduce our speakers um, so that the audience has an idea of the breadth and depth of uh, expertise that we're bringing to the topic today. So uh, one of our panelists is Dr. Jandell Allen Davis, who is the president and CEO of Craig Hospital in Denver, Colorado. Dr. Allen Davis is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and was in active practice for 25 years. Dr. Alan Davis is an active participant in the community and currently serves on several boards, uh, including the Colorado Hospital Association and is commissioner on the Colorado State Economic Development Com Commission. I'd also like to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Patty Gabo, who has spent her career at Denver Health, retiring as CEO in 2012 after a 20 year tenure in that position. She's a professor emerita at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and a master of the American College of Physicians. She was a founding member of the Federal Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission and currently serves on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Loan Institute um, uh, Board. Professor Roger Ritbo also joins us, and he is a distinguished professor of management emeritus at Auburn University Montgomery. He now serves as a lecturer in the MBA and health administration programs at the University of Colorado Denver's Business School. Two of his books are of special relevance to this program. First, The Ethical Governance in Healthcare was published by the American Hospital Association. And a second book, Sisters in Sorrow, details the experience of women prisoners who served as aides, technicians, and nurses in the infirmaries and hospitals in the Nazi concentration and death camps. And Dr. Matt DeCamp is an associate professor here with us in the Center for Bioethics and Humanities and Division of General Internal Medicine. Dr. DeCamp is a practicing internist, a health services researcher and philosopher, he employs both empirical and conceptual methods to identify and solve cutting edge problems in the interface of healthcare policy and bioethics. And one special emphasis of his research relevant today includes engaging patients in healthcare organizational decision making. So as you can see, we have quite a depth of uh, experience uh, here and expertise. And to kick us off and orient us all to the issue we're talking about, I wanna start with one question for uh, all of our panelists to briefly address to set the scene. And I'd like uh, each of you to describe some of the competing interests that you or a physician working in your setting have faced or observed based on a real uh, life example, if possible. And I'll start with you, Jendel. thank you. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Barrow. And um, thank you all out there, the 98 of you who have uh, chosen to, to uh, join us in this conversation. Um, in terms of answering this question, I found myself first writing is that we, we walk through life tripping over competing interests. They can be as simple as do I get up right now when the alarm clock goes off um, or get up and exercise do I, and, or, or stay in bed. So from very simple things like that to the very complex ones, like how to navigate the competing and sometimes conflicting interest in managing a pandemic. And there's all sorts of things in between. And I thought, you know, while I uh, can certainly talk as and speak from the position of um, being at the bedside caring for patients, it would be most useful to talk from the perspective of um, serving this incredible organization that I get to every day. Um, Things that we have to think about, I have to think about is balancing the desire or requirement to serve all who would like to receive rehabilitation, neuro rehabilitation at Craig, with any of a number of factors. And they include family and patient desires. This is family-centered rehabilitation. And we have to think about what families can actually actively participate in up to six hours of rehab every day. The ability to actively participate in a program due to physical limitations against that desire. Limited bed capacity. Insurance, insurer reimbursement limitations and constraints in the context of a relatively limited resource that's also costly to deliver in the manner that we do. Staffing capacities. There's always production pressures that we also have to balance. Certainly COVID-19 has uh, introduced some unique challenges and maybe brought some to the fore more blatantly because my belief over this last year and a half of navigating uh, this pandemic um, has certainly allowed all of us to find um, areas of opportunity in our systems to either shore them up or create new practices and processes while trying to balance. I can't tell you over this last year how many times I've said we have so many competing and conflicting interests, but some of them are safety for an entire community. Uh, family, patients, and staff, and for sure, from an ethical perspective, we have, uh, we constantly, I would dare say, um, confront making choices around autonomy and individual choice versus the public good uh, regarding safety. Things like masking, which is, uh, you'd think would be relatively simple, we know has not been, and even in a hospital setting such as ours hasn't been. Social distancing in a place that's used to hugging and sitting closely and doing all sorts of things against the safety. And then of course, the one we're navigating now around mandatory vaccines. Um, staff redeployments um, in the early days was one of those competing interests we had to versus layoffs versus continuing people in current roles with less or no productivity and how we manage that in the early days of the pandemic. I have to give our teams incredible, incredible hats off to the way that they um, set about uh, making sure that we could continue to keep people employed because we had no layoffs. Um, but it did mean that people had to do work that was not necessarily in their wheelhouse, for example, when the outpatient department was closed. Less so at Craig, a couple of other things I'd say, less so at Craig, but consumer demands for more costly yet marginally, um, if at all, um, effective or more effective uh, treatments and impacts on the cost of care at an insurance or group level, or even those impacts at the individual level are things that we have to all be navigated. Pressures to have a full suite of caregivers available in our hospitals at any time to meet their needs and wants versus the cost, financial, reputational, inter-staff issues of doing so. And can certainly talk more if that's not clear. And then finally, the one that I think um, uh, is at the heart of some of the conversation we're having today, but certainly compares and contrasts in some, I think, important ways to Nazi Germany, is what I call either the perfect virtuous cycle or the most maddening competing interest. And that is without a margin, there isn't a mission. And without a mission, there isn't a margin. So that is one that we are really constantly navigating. And I certainly have to think about those things um, uh, from this chair. Well, thank you, that, that runs the gamut and also introduces the many stakeholders that we're going to be talking about in this competing interest uh, process. But to set the stage uh, some more, Matt uh, DeCamp, can I? call on you? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. And thanks to everyone for attending. It's great to be a, a part of this. And I think to answer this question, I will put on my physician hat as a practicing internist and note that it's really only been the past few years to set the stage that there have been more physicians employed in owning their own practices. And this does create that possibility for divided loyalties 
now between the patient and the employer, which is obviously different than loyalties to the government or a state-sponsored entity, but it still has the potential to profoundly affect people's you know, well-being for good and for bad. And just to give you two examples from my own personal experience as a physician, I see these divided loyalties manifest a couple ways. One is something we don't often talk about, and that's regarding time, the concept of time. To many patients and physicians, medicine feels, I think, increasingly time pressured, requiring more off hours time, or valuing time with the computer rather than the patient. Things that seem on the surface to devalue the role of relationship, and yet we know the relationships can be fundamental to ethical concepts such as trust or compassion and respect that relationships play such a key role in this. Another concrete example really does relate to quality metrics, a really good thing in healthcare to think about standardizing quality and assuring quality to patients and the public. Um, there's pressure to meet quality metrics that support revenue, but that may or may not be in an individual patient's best interest, either in terms of what they are, or how the quality metric has to be met. So as a commonplace example for me, I would take quality metrics around blood pressure targets. These, for example, require either an in-person visit or a visual observation by me of the patient at home with their blood pressure cuff. Now the former can of course be in tension with safety issues during COVID-19. I may not want a patient to have to come to the office to demonstrate that blood pressure targets being met. And the latter seems to suggest that a patient's word doesn't count. So if a patient tells me their blood pressure is controlled at home, that doesn't count for me when I document it in the EHR to meet that particular quality metric. So those are just a couple examples um, that I think strike me as important from the standpoint of a practicing physician. Um, hope that those are some interesting fodder for others too as we continue this dialogue. So thanks again. Great, thank you. I mean, this is great, really uh, giving us a perspectives from the organizational standpoint, the practicing uh, physician. And um, I think that uh, now, uh, Patty, you will give us uh, another, another perspective or maybe a similar one, <laughs> but oh, more problems, you. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, there are three primary competing interests that I think every institutional leader faces to some degree but they do come into sharper focus for a safety net leader. So I'll talk about those. The first is the tension, which Jandell alluded to between financial survival and remaining true to the core safety net mission of an open door for everyone. And the degree, degree of that challenge is faced by the fact that at Denver Health, the last year I was there, 40% of the patients were uninsured. That came to $450 million, for which the city supplied 27 million. So that creates tension. And um, I'll give you a on the ground example. Uh, many of you remember that about a decade ago, most of the metropolitan hospitals closed their psych units. Uh, because of the low reimbursement rate and, and because this is a challenging group of patients. So Denver Health, which had been losing money on psychiatry for decades, asked the question, should we stay open? And our CFO, let me underscore that, our CFO answered the question, if we don't do it, who will? So not only did we keep it open, but we expanded our psych services. And this is a good example of how sometimes being committed to doing the good will lead to doing well. Because since everybody else was closed, we started to get paying patients and started making money in psychiatry. <laughs> the second tension is keeping the balance that between the needs of the individual patient and the needs of the population, of the community in which you're embedded. And when I first became CEO, we had a meeting with the doctors and an ethicist and asked the question, what should be the ethical principle guiding Denver Health's decision-making? 
Should it be the most good for the sickest or should it be the good for most patients? And we decided that as a safety net, we had to do, do the second. So let me give you another on the ground example. When everybody was first buying MRI machines, so a long time ago, Denver Health didn't have one. And so we came to a budget cycle where we could either get an MRI or open school-based clinics in every school in Montbello. And we opted for school-based clinics following the principle of what is good for more people. Uh, and uh, that's an example. And the third tension um, also Jan Dell alluded to, and that's how do you maintain the highest quality physicians while not falling into the monetary traps that most physician employment has? And so we tried to avoid those traps by having no contracts and no bonus payments and no physician practice plan. And uh, we can probably talk more about the nuances of that uh, as we go on. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Patty. I mean, it was great to see how establishing that principle really helped you with some of these uh, challenges. We're gonna go into that a bit more in the solutions. Uh, and now I would just like to pass it to Roger for the last word on sort of setting the scene here for what some of these challenges are from his perspective. Uh, I'm gonna remind people of two things. One is the golden rule, which we all probably know. Um, treat others the way we would like to be treated. And I'm gonna use a, a newer version of that, which is emerging called the platinum rule, which is treat others the way they would like or need to be treated so that we are not imposing our values on them without understanding where they come from. This plays out in a variety of different ways. Uh, from a patient's point of view, they have conflicting interests, healthcare, filling prescriptions, clothing, utilities, education, transportation. So we are part of their paradigm of choice or conflict if they are of limited means. Um, so we, we need not to forget that. And I think sometimes it does get lost. It gets lost at an organizational level when employers are negotiating health insurance contracts. They want to get as much coverage as they can for the limited amount of money they're willing to put into it. The public sector in many states has not expanded their Medicaid programs, which is leaving people out of the system or, or coming back in as part of that uncompensated care that, are, uh, that was just mentioned. So I think those are important to remember. And that's playing out again today for reasons that are way complicated beyond this program, dentistry is generally not covered under health insurance. As someone said, why are teeth different than toes? Well, there's a long history about that. And the American Dental Association with its 162,000 members right now is lobbying very strenuously not to be included in any Medicare expansion. And they're echoing the same arguments that the American Medical Association made in the 60s against being involved in government programs. Too much regulation is gonna limit, well, they don't say this, but it will limit their income. Uh, they'll have to meet standards that they believe will be unreasonable. And there's a variety of other things. So they have moved to protect their providers members, that's their job, at potentially the expense of patients because people need dental care. Uh, Another conflict that, I, that hasn't been mentioned, I think is worth noting, is the continual conflict between the pharmaceutical industry and the providers. And the uh, unethical and sometimes clearly criminal uh, behaviors that have been unearthed. And so I think that those just need to be not forgotten about. Uh, the Sackler family and Purdue Pharmacy is just one. There's a trial in California now. There are other federal investigations. And these represent competing interests that have sided on the side of money rather than on patient safety. Um, and physicians are sometimes caught in that and accept gifts that maybe they shouldn't have accepted or lavish speaking fees. Um, so that raises a question of them for them. And the last one I, I would mention 
that we not forget is that sometimes our own government gets involved in unethical behaviors that reflect some of the patterns that we talked about in the beginning from the Nazis. Uh, for 20 years, I taught at Auburn University and Auburn University in Montgomery. Tuskegee, Alabama is the location of one of the most horrific things that's happened by a government funded program where 400 African-Americans were actively not treated for syphilis. Uh, they were lied to, they violated every one of the principles that Ira mentioned for the Daniels Fund, uh, and uh, that these things happened. And that happened from 1932, I believe, to 1972. So while the Second World War was going on, we had some things in this country that have been explored, investigated, and have led to some major important changes. And that many of us cringe sometimes when we have to go through human subjects reviews and institutional review boards, but thank heavens we do. So uh, I just think those are some of the things that are on my mind. Thank Great. you. Thank you. I mean, this was an incredible uh, summary of all, all of the uh, interests facing us. Um, Roger, you touched on one related to the pharmaceutical industry that's near and dear to my heart, but uh, let's, uh, let's expand it back out. One of the themes that I think all of you touched on was the responsibility to individual patients, but you also clearly pointed out how complicated that is because we're also dealing with patients as a public health community or the community itself or your institution and their families. Um, so it's quite complicated, but given that it is a core principle of healthcare uh, to put the patient first, um, I'd like to ask you how you can uh, actually uh, implement this at an institutional level. So um, what sort of policy or principles um, could you put into place um, to, to work this at an institutional level? And I think we wanted to, uh, Jandell, start with you again on this question. Sure. So actually the way I approach the question is uh, to, to actually think about it at an individual level, because I have this belief that institutions or organizations are actually organic as well. So let me just start with thinking about uh, patient and family centeredness, which is um, the way that I sought to practice my 25 years of caring for patients and certainly am working in a place that lives and breathes through its mission, patient and family centeredness. But I believe we oversimplify what that means um, and make some underlying assumptions about what it means. And despite that, I do believe that is, if we can stay in that space of mission, purpose, patient and family to the extent that family is relevant, which it always is, um, uh, typically, typically makes doing the right thing, I think, a little bit easier. But it does underneath those, um, that, that sort of patience, putting patients and families at the center of all we do um, mantra. It places a huge responsibility on healthcare and other professionals to provide complete and unbiased access to treatment and management options. I think, Roger, your mention of Tuskegee is a perfect example of a complete violation of that. Um, we have to think in terms of literacy, both, lit both um, verbal and written, and we should say um, particular healthcare literacy because we don't talk to patients in simple language. Transcultural considerations have to be considered. And all of this has to be embedded in a strong belief back to the Daniels Fund uh, principles of trust and respect. And in most circumstances, um, I love Matthew that you mentioned time. Um, I think that we, we feel this constant time scarcity but I think there's actually more time to allow for this sort of decision-making than healthcare seemingly thinks. And in fact, because of a lot of the stuff we put in between the ability for doctors, I certainly felt that, and, I, and Matthew, you talked about this, um, certainly felt um, that, that crush, that pressed, uh, pressure of trying to make sure that I treat that patient as if she is my only one um, against all the other production pressures we have. So then when I elevate that sort of context to, a, um, from the individual level to the organizational level, I have some of the same responsibilities. I have to make very clear to employees and staff when there are competing interests. I gotta speak in plain language about complex business issues, interests and conflicts instead of speak in business, which um, I think is a little bit easier if you weren't sort of born of the business school and started in healthcare in some ways. And it too is very, very much uh, grounded in a strong amount of trust and respect. Um, uh, 
lives. And then um, this whole notion of what the stakeholders or shareholders, if you stop to think about it through the lens of this nonprofit, for-profit, but in particular for-profit, I actually think all the stakeholders in healthcare ultimately win if we can arrive at a higher sense of what the returns are to business. And those businesses, whether they're nonprofit or for-profit that exceed a simple financial equation. Um, that's the sad reality of what we've sort of distilled so many of our sectors down to this sort of simple financial equation. At the same time, we're seeing the sort of movement uh, to sort of advance beyond that. But we need to be looking at healthcare at, the, at trying to really every day think about how do we meet the quadruple aims of this excellent care, high quality, uh, high quality care, um, an amazing care experience and affordability delivered by, um, I'd say, whole capable, healthy uh, providers, the quadruple aim. I think we need to be thinking about reputa reputational returns. And when we think about, I mean, I heard a phrase last week that just makes me cringe when I hear people talk about the medical industrial complex, which I'd like to act as if it doesn't exist, but the reality is it does. And we've got to begin to think about reputational returns when we talk that way. The other thing is that while, while shareholders, whether for profit, which is the way we're used to thinking about the term, but stakeholders more broadly, we need to be able to think about how our, our decisions around balancing all these competing um, interests um, enable us or throw us right in the middle of regulatory scrutiny and its subsequent outcomes, which are not always pretty. And then I do think it's super important since many of us are um, need to be in the healthcare is right in the center of this. We are an anchor institution in all the communities in which we serve. We really do need to think about our community and think about our social responsibility as well. So that's the way that I take this thing that happens in an exam room um, and then the competing interests that we have to think about there and sort of elevate it to um, this organism called a hospital in this case. <laughs> There is theory that says that organizations are uh, individuals, right? So I think uh, that's that's a good way to to think about that. Um, Patty, did you want to add to this uh, discussion? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Well, first of all, I think uh, this principle absolutely has to apply at the institutional level. If it's not the overarching goal of the institution, the employees, especially the cl clinicians will face daily ethical dilemmas. And I think that's one of the principal problems of burnout is this disconnect. Um, regarding organizational structure, Janelle, uh, Jandel uh, touched on it. I personally have trouble finding the intersection with for-profit and venture capital owned entities between their primary fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders and investors and putting the patient first. And I think boards of these institutions have avoided being very clear and transparent about what this intersection means and how it plays out. And I think that's a prime board responsibility. Um, one of the other big conflicts um, is the common practice of executive bonuses based on income and clinician bonuses based on volume and income. Will an executive with such a bonus limit access to uninsured and Medicaid patients? Will they not build freestanding EDs, urgent care centers, clinics, and hospitals in rich neighborhoods and neglect the impoverished neighborhoods? Will they invest in departments that have the biggest return on investment rather than where the greatest need is in healthcare in their community? And will clinicians be drawn to overuse? Uh, I think these are questions, again, that boards have to address. And they have by and large avoided them and just fall into the trap of, oh yes, bonuses are great, let's give them, that'll get us what we want. Well, it'll incent some very uh, non-constructive things. Um, a critical 
uh, policy issue is the conflict of interest for executives who serve on for-profit boards of healthcare vendors. And as was mentioned, physicians with vendor relationships. These need very tight guardrails and they require complete transparency, one of uh, Daniel's principles. And again, I think boards have by and large avoided really getting into this. Finally, if you want everyone in an institution to put the patient first, the organization must demonstrate meaningful respect for its employees. And that starts with paying every employee, including contract workers, a living wage and reducing the lack of equity between what executives get and what frontline workers get. Thank you, Patty. So both of you have sort of portrayed the uh, physician as the, the person caught in the middle here in some ways uh, in this uh, uh, divide between the patient and the organization. Matt, did you want to comment on that? Well, I, I feel um, I'm not sure what more I can say after Patty's comments. <laughs> but, um, I might underscore one, which is I, I certainly on the front lines have felt this tension between the push and drive toward high value care and value-based practices and still being evaluated based on volume or revenue. And that does create an interesting, I think, distress, moral distress for frontline clinicians who are experiencing those kinds of mixed messages. But maybe for a different take, and maybe putting a little bit of my philosopher's hat on also, you know, I, I happen to think that the obligation, the relationship between a healthcare professional, physician, nurse, or otherwise, and a patient actually is sort of special. And that this primary obligation to the patient's best interest in that case doesn't actually generalize very well to the institutional or organizational level, and maybe it shouldn't. Um, I think if it does, it only comes about indirectly. You know, if an institution or an organization publicly states that it puts patients first, you know, now you've created something like a promise to which the organization can be accountable. And it opens the organization up to at least having actions scrutinized and critiqued by these principles. It's a matter of integrity. An institution should be accountable to those principles, to their mission statements, their values, and so on. But I'm just not sure that the kind of dogged commitment that a healthcare professional has to a real individual patient actually generalizes up to the level of the institution for all the reasons we've talked about. I think the competing interests are different. The stakeholders are slightly different. In some ways, my life as a clinician may be a little easier, in fact, to have that commitment to an individual's own well-being and interest, even if I am balancing some of those competing priorities. So maybe a different view than what's been said so far, but I do think there's something special about that relationship, that fiduciary relationship between clinician and patient. That's really interesting, Matt, because I think, you know, when we were hearing about some of these organizational uh, policies, it seems to be they were really there to protect that uh, relationship between the physician and the the patient and, and enable it uh, in, this, in this kind of setting to manage the competing interests. So Roger, I saw you had your hand up and then I actually have a question for you coming up. So if you wanna comment on this briefly, we'll shift gears in a second. Thank you. Um, I serve on the uh, Rose Medical Center and the American Occupational Therapy Association's ethics commissions, ethics committees. And as many in this audience know on this program, ethics committees have two roles. One of which is kind of is the reactive. When there is a case going on, sometimes right in the moment, the ethics committee gets called and needs a quick decision. And so we do that in a variety of different ways, in person, on the phone, virtually, but somebody needs some ethical guidance in a treatment plan or a treatment decision. The second one gets to the point that Jendel, Patty, and um, Matthew just raised, which is the organizational level, and how do we proactively educate people about these dilemmas? And my concern is that too often it's one and done, that 
there may be a case, we may reflect on it. It may be included in new provider, not just physician, but broadly providers orientation to the facility. They may have had an ethics class, but if it's not reinforced, it gets lost. It gets lost because of the pressures of time. And I think part of our role as professionals is to reflect on our practice. And so having these conversations, and I didn't make the connection that was just made previously about how this lack of understanding may contribute to stress, burnout, and turnover, uh, especially in this new era of COVID where every fault line in our society has been exposed, not just in healthcare, but education, housing, employment, uh, et cetera. So ha having, finding time at the institutional level to let the providers discuss this may help bridge what Matt, Matthew just raised about the difference, the gap between the individual provider and the institutional organization's needs. Uh, I fall on the side of transparency. And so I actually do look at IRS 990 forms occasionally. Um, you know, just it helps. It's part of the information. It's part of their transparency. And we can hold them accountable for meeting their mission. So. Right. So the Daniels Thank Fund, uh, sorry, the Daniels Fund principles are cropping up with transparency, accountability, trust. And uh, interestingly, in our uh, questions here, uh, someone has uh, asked about the um, kind of divide or the competing interest between business ethics and medical ethics. And that was actually a question we were going to uh, switch to, Roger, with you to ask you what the business ethics community could learn from healthcare ethics uh, or, or vice versa. Um, but it's interesting, do you see these as being in conflict or not, business no. and medical ethics? I see, I see that they have different implementations, but I think some of the goals are still the same. Uh, the first one I think is totally accurate is that it starts at the top. If the governing structures, if the chief executive leadership of any organization, public or private, profit or nonprofit, don't walk the, implement the mission, talk about the mission, remind people the bigger picture. It will be taken for granted today and be perhaps forgotten tomorrow. And so it's not just uh, posting the mission statement in, in the hallways, but it's actually reminding people more than just in the annual report that these are our values. And this is how this decision fits into those values. I think it's important for organizations to periodically review and update their mission and make it a living code, not just something that was in an article of incorporation. Same with their values. Uh, the example that was just given earlier about how the mission and values of care help make a decision. And we're a guiding principle. Do you serve the broader or do you serve the, the, the most needy patient? Uh, and understanding that that's important. I think if it's not, let me say it positively. I think when these mission and values, whether it's for profit, non for profit, I think we can learn from business and healthcare about tying it to performance reviews, not just based on volume or revenue, but maybe on quality outcomes. And if organizations reward certain behaviors, they will continue. If they punish certain behaviors, they are likely to stop. And not doing anything just means that we'll keep on muddling our way through. And that may be a safer strategy, but it might not be the better strategy. And the last one, it just cycles back to what you said, Lisa, about. Um, transparency. I think it's important for people to share the decision and the struggle that they had to reach these decisions so others can learn. Others within the same institution or professionally across boundaries. And so while we're all, while we recognize that hospitals are in, providers are in competition with each other, they're also part of the same profession with ultimately a goal. 
No, that's great. And I think we have to, uh, as Jen Dell said, not be afraid of uh, speaking business, right? Or we have to, we, we see a lot of commonalities uh, here. And I think we, we share those ethics. And we have time for just one more question before we're going to open it up to Q&A. And there's so much experience uh, about leadership on this panel. Um, I would just like to uh, ask, um, you know, how can ethical leadership uh, help manage these types of interest? How can, you know, what should we expect from our leaders? Uh, how can we foster uh, that leadership? Uh, Patty, did you want to start out on that? Uh, I can. Uh, I, I think uh, Roger uh, uh, sort of set the stage for an answer in that I've always said everything goes from the top down except revolution. Uh, and so I think that uh, how uh, the leader portrays what the ethical responsibilities are, how they walk the talk, I, I think is, is really important. And, uh, uh, and I think one way, um, which is what uh, Roger also said, is you have to say it over and over again. I used to say, I thought I had a psychiatric defect of uh, perseveration because I was always saying the same thing, but I, I think uh, that's important. I also think to get back to what I said earlier is that if you as a leader do not show ethical and respectful treatment of your employees, they will never believe that you're going to show respectful and ethical treatment of uh, the patients. Uh, so I think that's important. And, and I think that the other thing that leaders have to do is not have, not take unto themselves privileges that often go with leadership. So for example, at Denver Health, we had no physician dining room, no physician special parking, no executive bonuses, no physician bonuses, the same package for everybody, whether, I mean, obviously executives and doctors made more than the housekeepers, but the, the package of benefits was exactly the same for everyone. And I, I think that it's those kinds of uh, operational behaviors that really translate that this is really what we're about as an organization. Thank that actually uh, helps transition us to one of our questions now from the, the audience, because you were talking about these equivalent incentives. And uh, we have a, a question on how the cultural movement uh, towards equity, specifically health equ equity, impacts our traditional incentive structures. So how this might uh, actually uh, play out in your organizations um, and how do we uh, maintain that equity and also have you know these business incentives. Jendel, would you like to? Uh, you no, know, I think I, I, I even remember feeling this way in my uh, former role where somehow or other, we had made it that you couldn't be thinking about finance and thinking about equity at the same time. First of all, that is inherently so biased. Just hearing the words come out of my mouth, I was, it sort of hit me yet again, that we make these things, we turn these things into competing interests instead of recognizing that we have a number of um, uh, duties underneath our missions and underneath what's our, our whatever organization, uh, Patty, uh, called out the, you know, the, in an earlier conversation, how many nonprofit systems, for example, or not for profit systems are falling short of their, um, their uh, community responsibility, their charitable obligations. And it's not just about charity care, although that is a significant part for certainly most healthcare organizations, but it's not the only thing. Um, and so this idea of um, viewing that as attention, as opposed to it is what we do for business. We care for, we care for those who have means and we care for those who don't. 
And it is on us to figure out, um, well, because we've got two sides of the ledger as, um, as leaders of these systems. We've got expenses and we've got revenue. And we've got to make sure that to the, to the fullest extent possible, we keep the two in, in, um, in as close of something called balance or budget as we can. But part of it starts with just really recognizing that it's not that we fill the beds or that we fill our offices and make sure that we're doing all of our uh, billing and all appropriately. But you don't start there. You start there from what your mission is. Your mission is, especially as a non-for-profit, is to care for the community. And that's certainly what I learned. Um, I, I spoke that from the Bible of Kaiser Permanente as the community benefits lead at, the, at the, the, the health plan there that last nine years I was there. So we shouldn't view these as competing or conflicting. And yet that's one of the things that uh, helped me sort of um, uh, put the other on the other side of that no margin, no mission, which actually a sister, by the way, a sister's a charity created that no margin, no mission quote, but put on the other side of it without living your mission really fully living your mission, you're going to constantly be chasing your margin. So that's the way I think about it. Great. I think you turned that question on its head quite appropriately. So um, that's a, a, a hope it opened a lot of eyes to, to thinking about that. Anybody else want to comment on that? Otherwise, I might move on to another question because um, we've got a lot of good ones from the audience. This one we've touched on uh, a bit. Um, so just see if you want to say anything else on it. But it's this idea of, um, you know, the blurring of the lines between the nonprofit and the for profit organizations. Um, and, you know, the question is how do these nonprofits justify their tax exempt status um, when they have highly paid executives, et cetera, et cetera, um, and they have to limit resources for patients? Patty, I thought you might want to say something mm -hmm. on that. Yes, and I, I want to be transparent that I chair the Lown Institute board, which has uh, developed a uh, hospital index uh, looking at social responsibility. And one of that was a calculation of what they call fair share, which is what is an not-for-profit hospital giving in terms of community benefit, looking at their 990s, and what would be their tax uh, responsibility. And what they found is that 72% of all not-for-profits have a big gap in that fair share calculation. Um, for some hospitals, that is $200 million a year or more. And in total for not-for-profits, it was $17 billion. Um, and um, so I think we have to really step back. And there was a, a piece in Sunday's Denver Post about this issue of tax exemption. Um, and really, I think it's time to step back and say, in this current age, given where we've come in healthcare and given what the practices are operationally, do we need to get rid of this concept of tax exemption? Um, there was an article uh, this weekend in the Cleveland papers about the Cleveland Clinic um, not paying taxes in Cleveland, which costs Cleveland 40 million a year, and yet they're building for-profit institutions in other countries. And where's the disconnect here? So uh, I really do think that um, we need to step back and say, uh, is it time to forget tax exemption for uh, healthcare facilities? Yeah, and I think that would definitely address, you know, the, the concerns that people have that they think these nonprofits are should act in a different way or it can be structured in a different way. Jindal, did you want to? Just a, a, a quick, um, I wouldn't call it quite a rebuttal, but I'd say a yes and. You still have to figure out how we meet community need. And my fear, if we go to, if we take out nonprofit as opposed to doubling down on the 501R requirements that were created as a result of the Affordable Care Act, if we really um, adhere to those, which is that you can't let all of or the preponderance of your uh, nonprofit um, uh, uh, expenditures, we should say, uh, go to uncompensated care or disproportionate share kinds of arrangements, but that you truly need to 
be living up to the findings in our community health needs assessments and getting better at doing those. Um, because my worry would be if we did that, that we'd see even fewer investments actually in community, which means we're doing less to um, actually deal with all of the um, preventable demand that comes to our front doors um, by, by avoiding getting into community around education and violence and race and ethnicity and equity and all the other issues, um, economic opportunity that we know we as anchor institutions, I think have some responsibility uh, to, to help solve too. Right. So it's more about how that money's used, where it's going. So yeah, good point. Um, we have a couple of really insightful comments that are going to bring us kind of down from the organizational level uh, a bit. Um, and this one is somebody's asking uh, us to think about competing interests between um, navigating compassion fatigue, you know, team support, self-care. And a lot of you alluded to this in terms of COVID-19. Um, and the increasing need for those who work in healthcare due to um, their increased needs, decreasing healthcare uh, workforce. Um, does anybody want to mm. comment on, on that? So basically, the, the competing interest between taking care of yourself, I think, and your family, and then delivering the best care you can, you know, within all of these um, restrictions. Yeah, Matt, maybe, maybe I'll go to you first. Yeah. Maybe just to start is that I think, you know, if you think like a, a clinician, as I do, I'm prone to, you have to think about diagnosing the problem correctly, I think, first, as being the first step to understanding that compassion fatigue, because without an understanding of what the problem is, you know, we're not likely to come up with a treatment to sort of fix it. And so, you know, I mean, in my own experience, for example, I often think that, you know, the solution to burnout is not like a vacation. The solution to burnout is not 15 minutes of meditation in the morning when the root causes have more to do with, I think, some of the competing interests or some of the issues that we're talking about. Um, senses of moral distress, a feeling like you know the right thing to do for a patient, but you can't do it. And so, Part of me is to answer your question with a question and say, well, what really is the cause of the phenomenon we're experiencing of burnout, whether it's in COVID or in usual times? Uh, and, and is what we're seeing now during COVID more a manifestation of usual times plus? Um, just my initial reaction. And I really want to hear what others think too on the panel. That's a really interesting point because um, I sometimes think of the term conflicts of interest or competing interests as ethical shorthand. You know, when there's something that uh, people can't uh, figure out uh, how to deal with, or it seems to be detracting from their main mission, uh, they'll call it a competing or conflict of interest. But you're right, that might not be the main uh, issue. It might be something else going on. So Patty, did you have? Um... Yeah, I, I, a couple of comments. One, I, I do want to come back to, I, I think at the core of burnout is that many healthcare institutions have in fact lost their ethical center. And this creates a dilemma, I think, as Matt said, between um, every day, if you have people put in uh, a ethical conflict, day after day, um, th that leads to burnout. I also think that many of our institutions have lost the sense of being a family. Um, and you just can't be running. You, this isn't like running a hardware store. And not that they shouldn't be like a family either, but, but there should be much more sense of community I think within these institutions, uh, and we certainly, I, I think, I always was amazed at Denver Health at how everybody in that organization, whether they were a housekeeper or a chief of service, really felt like they were part of a family. The, the other thing that sort of gets to Jandell's point about being an anchor institution, healthcare is the biggest employer in, in many cities. And so if they could treat their employees uh, well, I think it would help with it. So I'll go through the list, pay a fair wage uh, to everybody, um, 
have childcare for employees. That is a big stress for women uh, in, in the market. And healthcare is made up of 80% of the workforce is women. And yet we don't even give paid family leave routinely. So paid family leave, child care, fair wages. Um, th these are all things that I think could help. Uh, and it goes beyond, as Matt says, giving people uh, 15 minutes of meditation or a, um, a yoga uh, lesson. Uh, so let's get to the real uh, things. And one of the things we did at Denver Health was uh, educational payments for people who were getting GEDs or English as a second language, help people move up the scale uh, no matter where they start. These are all things that we can do to help our employees feel like uh, they're valued. And when people feel valued and they're paid fairly and they're given time off and they have child care, and there's no ethical dilemma, there'll be a lot less burnout. Just real, quick, just real quickly, I think another thing um, that for sure has added to both the workload and is at the heart of the, um, a lot of the burnout and fatigue, and I know this person mentioned compassion fatigue as well, um, is the fact that we have added so much complexity to the days of physicians and nurses. EHRs, for example, were supposed to simplify our lives and we're still trying to figure out the benefits that we realize from them. And when you look at what's happened to the, in terms of the quality of healthcare, all the promise of things that actually increase the amount of time that physicians and nurses and other therapists and therapies have to do in order to, to document for the myriad, and I'm not necessarily complaining, I'm just calling it out, the myriad of um, external reporting agencies the redundancy and the overuse and the places where the, I should just say the redundancy of all the reporting that we have to do externally adds administrative cost, time, um, and burden to those who have to do this kind of thing. And so we didn't simplify healthcare over this last decade, let alone 20 years. We've made it harder for physicians. In the article, I think from the New England Journal, I'm thinking back in the it's probably the early aughts that showed that just if we were to make sure that we were um, um, capturing, um, ordering, and reviewing all of the age and gender appropriate uh, tests that we would do it at, it's something like four hours onto a physician's day or a caregiver's day. It doesn't have to just be physician. So um, we've all, it's not just about the, these, you can give people all these wonderful and nice to haves. But when they're here, you go home at night without much of a brain left. <laughs> Luckily, we regrow them overnight if you sleep well. So, Well, I mean, we all believe in the ethics and the compliance uh, rules, and that, that does add to the burden, but it's so important. Roger. Yeah, just one nice vignette. Uh, in my classes on leadership, I have the students write a leadership autobiography. Now, these are providers, people who work in healthcare broadly. Some of them are in chief medical officers, it's a whole range, uh, risk management, it's a whole range. And the hardest part they have in writing their leadership autobiography is how do they achieve a work-life balance? And it's in the grading rubric, but that kind of gets a little slept over as it would have if I were writing it when I was in my 30s, 40s, and early 50s. Uh, to me, that was, I, I did what Matthew said, I, you know, I'll take my 15 minutes. I'll take a walk, but that doesn't really, that's not really integrating a work-life balance. It's just getting decompression. Uh, so it, it, it's both institutional as Patty and Jandell was saying, but I think it's also in, oops, my light just went, um, that it's also individual and how do we achieve that for ourselves? And if we can find that balance, it might help us find that balance with others at work and push the organization to do some of these things. This isn't, new. Everything that Patty just mentioned is nothing new, but it's a commitment to make these things happen. And, and I think what maybe, we're hearing maybe is the money. These, yeah, if we have these ethical principles integrated into our being, really, and into our organization and how we treat people as well as patients who work with us, um, then we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't have to relegate it to 15 minutes here and here and there. That's that's the challenge we're 
we're up against. Um, I want to ask a, a, a question that we have here from our um, group. And this one comes up a lot with conflicts of interest. And I think it was Patty, you mentioned how uh, some boards of CEOs, you know, have had financial ties. And certainly a lot of those have been very well publicized. So, uh, you know, do you think that focusing on these sort of egregious behaviors of individuals or, or positions like we see in the media, um, that we avoid looking at the slippery slope problem where these unethical behaviors have evolved over a period of years. So, so basically, if we're focusing uh, in the media on some of those high profile, uh, you know, competing interest issues, are we losing the forest for the trees and not looking at how maybe institutions have developed some unethical uh, behaviors over the years? How do you want to tackle that? Well, since I brought it up, I'll maybe start it off. Uh, well, I, I think we always do have to call out and hold accountable egregious behavior. I, I mean, what, we can't ignore that. Uh, people need to be accountable for it. But I think uh, what I said is I, I think boards have by and large not faced up to these conflict of interest. Uh, there, there certainly has been a tension and Jendel and others can uh, weigh in on this about physicians involvement with uh, drug companies, with device manufacturers, that, that's been sort of put forward and guidelines have been created, although, uh, as you saw the recent report, device manufacturers have really not taken over where the pharmaceutical industry has left off with individual physician uh, conflicts. Uh, but I think at the uh, higher levels, and there was a study a number of years ago looking how many of boards of uh, healthcare vendors are filled with executives from particularly academic institutions. And, uh, and the boards have really not put clear guidelines and guardrails around that. In fact, if you go back to the issue that happened uh, in one of the Boston hospitals with the CEO, uh, having stock in Moderna and Moderna using that institution for a trial. Um, and uh, the board response was this had been approved and was within their guidelines. Uh, so I, I think boards have to really come to grips with what these are and we have to be transparent. No patient should ever be taken care of by a physician who is getting payments from a device or manufacturing company and the patient not know that is being involved in it. And uh, no CEO should be involved with some company that is doing business with the organization unless that's on the landing page of, of the organization. So uh, to go back to Daniels, we have to be transparent and we have to have clear guidelines about what these relationships can be. But we should still, it's not either or, we should still call out the bad actors. Any other? Not either or, yes. Any other comments on that? So, so we've had a couple of uh, comments here on healthcare financing, capitated reimbursement models, um, how these might uh, contribute to the problem of uh, competing um, interests. So uh, anybody wanna comment on that? Because I think, you know, as patients coming in, they're thinking, uh, you know, how to, how to pay for my healthcare often. It's interesting because they're probably not thinking of the financial ties of the board members at all. <laughs> and that, you know, we really do need to be transparent about that, but they're thinking about the financing of their health care. And so how does this, um, you know, how do these different systems uh, exacerbate or not these conflicts of interest? Matt, you were going to say take that on? Well, yeah, you know, I guess my overall take on different financing systems is that there's no free lunch. Exactly. 
And whatever system we choose is going to have advantages and disadvantages, whether it's fee for service encourages more, capitated payment may encourage less services for any particular individual. And I think part of managing it is, is, is number one, being upfront and honest and transparent about what those trade-offs are and not hiding them. Um, so I, you know, I, I think you're right that from an individual patient perspective, of course, the concerns are largely around out-of-pocket costs and their own particular financial burden related to care. But on the other hand, sometimes I've wondered if we underestimate the role that sort of social solidarity and solidarity in communities could play in helping facilitate more open conversations around the overall high amount that our country spends on healthcare. Um, so I think there's no free lunch, but I think there may be ways forward for those of us who may be a little more interested in understanding ways to reduce healthcare spending and make it more efficient and more value-based and so on. No, I think if you've seen one um, value-based payment system you've seen or scheme, you've seen one value-based payment system or scheme. <laughs> Um, I found myself, as uh, you asked the question, uh, Lisa, thinking about um, inclusive design. And if we, when we set these payment structures up, and I'm just gonna ask these as maybe wicked questions, how honest are we about what we seek to fix in those systems? And how honest are we about that we, we, we wanna make sure that people still can make a decent living? That's not a bad thing to want. We want to make sure that we can reinvest in our organizations in whatever ways that um, uh, make sense. I, you know, I don't think capitalism is a horrible, horrible system. And so, some of it is that we, we've uh, put the emphasis in some areas and not in others. And in a lot of ways, we've completely ignored. I mean, I am a, a huge, huge believer. I thought some years ago, if we think, for example, of what um, it costs to treat uh, diabetes, whether it's in-state renal disease, heart disease, the eye disease, the disease itself, the neuropathies that come from diabetes. And we know the numbers, the legions of people who are walking around with pre-diabetes that we're not even treating, we're not even diagnosing. Imagine taking just, imagine saying, we're gonna bet on ourselves. How would that be for an interesting um, payment uh, design or value-based payment scheme where you say, we're gonna take the dollars out of amputations and in-stage renal disease where people are making tons of cash and we're gonna invest it in community. We're gonna diagnose and identify this pre-diabetes. And we're gonna actually invest in communities, in community-based models and organizations to actually get more into the prevention space in this space so that we can, until we actually deal with preventable demand, I don't think there is a scheme out there around value-based payment that's gonna do anything other then continue to work downstream, and maybe we'll pull, you know, on the, on the you know, the the uh, the metaphor, we'll pull fewer bodies out as they're coming down the stream, as opposed to actually going upstream and dealing with the the, the problems in um, healthcare, which are actually far more complex and will require not just healthcare folks to come together, but educators and employers and. And, and to some extent, the government, but not you know, to nearly the extent that we seem to think we need them involved in order to solve this problem. So inclusive design comes to mind for me for some reason. Very interesting. I think of uh, sometimes the competing interests between public health and individual health care. I mean, this has come up with COVID, right? You know, are we going to uh, go you know, all out on prevention or are we going to just, you know, as some states have now said, wait and treat people, you know? <laughs> and, and so I think that's, uh, you know, you, you brought up uh, how this could play out, you know, a good example of that. Roger, and what it does, wanna... Yeah, I was just going to say, Jandell's comment really strikes at well, going back to Daniel's fund, the, the issue of fairness and justice. Um, you're talking about justice at a, at a micro level, which is when an individual has the information, power, social, political power, economic resources to make decisions about their own health care, their own choices in life. And at a macro level, how do we then work institutionally and individually? to attack the issues that lead to some of those problems. And they're not disconnected. And when the profit motive gets in the way of that, my guess is it's the macro level that suffers. That 
you know, they're still looking out for, they have a responsibility to their stockholders uh, that they have to meet. And that's part of our pluralism of capitalism is that we allow that and encourage it. And we institutionalize it through our tax system, through our tax codes. Uh, so I think we can have both kinds of justice at the same time. And what the, the aspiration and the inspirational organizations are the one that try to do both both fight to protect and help the individual patient and then fight to alleviate the symptoms that create that. And, you know, the medical community deserves a lot of credit way back in the day of really seeing the consequences of lead paint. And, you know, rules changed, society got better because we got rid of that lead paint and it was disproportionately hitting communities of color, low income, et cetera, but it was all through our society. So there are good examples of how we can blend the justice across the individual and the society. And I think that's what Jandell's comment struck in me. They don't have to be competing. They can be complementary interests. And yeah, there is good money in doing well. Now, that's a great, great to draw that out. I mean, I think we've had some good examples today of these ethical principles applied all the way through the system to the individuals up through the organizational level. And that's what we really have been trying to illustrate. I think we have, nobody wants, else wants to come on, on that. We might have time for just one more uh, question. And we have a really interesting question on uh, kind of an, a new emerging uh, issue. Um, so this is one we hadn't really uh, talked about yet, but it's um, uh, the issue of ethical use of artificial intelligence in healthcare. And there's certainly been a lot uh, discussed lately on conflicts of interest related to artificial intelligence, like, you know, who's paying uh, behind the algorithms that are being written, uh, et cetera. But this question is more on our idea of applying um, an ethical use and ethical principles to using artificial intelligence um, in healthcare. Anybody want to comment on that? Matt. Yeah, I mean, it's, it strikes me as an issue that really does bring together a lot of different things we've talked about in the course of the conversation, whether it's relationships that institutions have with companies that need healthcare data for AI, you know, in the news, University of Chicago and others lawsuits over data privacy. And so those relationships and what's the nature of them. Um, also, the issues of, of longstanding historical disparities and inequities in access and care that result in the data we have today, but then cast a shadow and create current biases for the way these algorithms might operate. If you had an algorithm, so to speak, that would direct care management or certain resources, then how that algorithm operates will be affected by those historical structural injustices and problems. So it, it just strikes me as an issue that brings together a lot of those issues. At the same time, there's a new twist perhaps, which is a real lack of understanding or understandability of AI. We kind of attach onto it as the shiny new object and it sounds great, it's gonna solve lots of our problems, but I'm not sure that the fundamental issues and problems we've discussed are gonna be solved simply because we have a new tech tool. Um, so I don't know really how to answer the question other than it does seem to bring together in a lot of interesting ways, different issues we've talked about. And it's another case where how organizations and institutions respond is gonna make a really big difference into you know, how, how, how AI looks and whether it's successful. This may sound mushy. And if it does, I won't apologize. Um, but I think um, there is a role for all the tools that we um, have either developed or will continue to develop around the technologies with respect to how we care better for patients. But when it's all said and done, what patients want is connection and relationship to caregivers, whoever they may be. And, um, I, 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 would, I, I hope I'm long gone if we ever get to the point where that is a robot who's doing that and is, and is taking, whether that robot is literally something sitting in front of me or it's a machine where I put my symptoms in and it tells me, go here, get this pill, you're done. Um, and I think that that, and I actually think that simplifies in some ways, oversimplifies the, the power of artificial intelligence. 
um, because I don't think it can take the place of um, what, what actually that uh, meaningful human connection uh, can, can create in terms of stickiness and loyalty of a patient or a family to a system, a person, a practice. And more importantly than on the other side of that, I'm not sure how AI is supposed to help with adherence to treatment or, um, or, or compliance with treatment. That only comes when there's a sense, I think, of uh, a real connection to somebody who truly cares about me. Because if nobody, the machine can, the machine knows a lot, but that corny phrase, I don't really, no one really cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that's the part that we have to not let get drummed out of healthcare in service to any one of a number of other kinds of um, competing interests. So as we go forward. Yeah. That's a bit mushy, but we'll forgive you. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, and actually what I was thinking there was for, as you were speaking, uh, artificial intelligence, as, as these tools are developed, we could still uh, demand that these ethical principles be applied to their development. And I think that's what's missing now, you know, so they have to, we have to trust them. They should have integrity. They need to be developed transparently. Um, so maybe that would make them a little bit more, more human, but um, not, not, not like uh, talking to that real person. I, I also think that uh, words matter. And uh, I think thinking about AI as augmented intelligence instead of artificial intelligence could be useful because um, there is so much uh, that we could know about what would make, which patients we need to worry about, what would make a patient's life better uh, if we had uh, our own intelligence augmented in some way, but it shouldn't replace us. And, and so I think terminology matters. And so I think if we could start using that other term, it may enable us to achieve both the benefit of machine learning, but keep uh, the personal part of care. It's an interesting theme that's coming up today about how we want to convert some of what we're thinking of as competing to more complementary and really integrate these things into, um, in, into, into practice. So we're at about time for the wrap up and I'd like to um, give our panelists an opportunity um, to say just one uh, take home message for the audience. We have heard um, so many great examples today of um, how to integrate these ethical uh, principles into uh, practice um, and, uh, you know, but if any, uh, I'd like to ask everyone if they just want to give us one take home or uh, one solution that really jumps out at them. Do you want to start? I can, I can start from my perspective just to say something briefly that came to mind as we were talking. You know, I, a lot of leadership, I feel like, and I'm not saying this about anyone on the panel today, but I sometimes feel like ethical leadership, you'll hear things like, you know, talk the talk and walk the walk, you know, be explicit about the mission and really show it with your actions as well. But I guess I also just, what's, what came to mind was also the concept of leadership listening. You know, talking and walking doesn't include necessarily listening and, and listening to frontline people, whether it's clinicians or as we've mentioned, other types of employees, even contract workers. Um, I think a lot of the issues and ethical tensions that come up at the organizational level, there are people around who, who know they're going on and that leadership would do well to listen to those frontline voices to understand some of those challenges in greater detail. So maybe not, I, mean, I don't know how much of a take home lesson that is, but it's something that came to mind over the course of our conversation. Yeah, and we've been able to exchange some of that today. Great point, Matt. Anybody else would like to add a closing word or two? I, I see it as not a, comp uh, a conflict or competing interest, but healthcare, corporate world, connections between the two, know your customer, know your patient, and act in their best interest. Best interest, yeah. 
their best interest, not yours. Yes, their best interest. Yeah. No, I just end by saying that I have since um, been connected to the uh, Daniels Fund some years ago, and some of their programs, I've just been blown away by those business ethics. And um, we can absolutely take business off and just say those are ethics that all of us uh, to the fullest extent possible should try to follow. And I think we all also do, this may help uh, Matt Mania feel really good, is I think we all need, also need to really um, understand as leaders in these organizations, we all could, could do with a little bit better um, understanding of the principles of ethics, let alone medical ethics. And recognize that wouldn't it be nice if you purely knew when to deploy one or the other, but there's they'll be competing in conflicting ways that even those ethics play out. And, um, and it's nice to know that there are some rubrics and like all models, Models are great, they're, they're all flawed, but they're all useful um, to, to pull all of those things together to help uh, augment, to use that word again, augment our leadership and our serving of the organizations that we're privileged to, to be involved in. So thanks for the time today. I would just add that I think by and large boards of these institutions have not really wrestled with the core question of what does it mean from an institutional perspective to put patients first? And uh, I think that uh, they have the ultimate fiduciary responsibility for the institution. And we all need to push boards to think about it and be transparent about what has come from their thinking. Great. Thank you, Patty. I, I want to thank all of the panelists so much for these concrete suggestions uh, at the end and for the really great uh, conversation during the afternoon. Um, I want to thank our, our sponsors again uh, for this program. I also really uh, want to remind the audience oh, and thank everybody actually for participating. We couldn't address all the individual questions, but we uh, did cover quite a few of them. And uh, in about three to five days, we're gonna follow up with all the participants with um, some take home messages uh, from this uh, session. Uh, you'll get a copy of the Daniels Fund Ethics Principles that we have been uh, discussing and uh, you know, saying how important it is to integrate these at all levels of healthcare and that they're not just business ethics. I love that comment. They're just ethical principles uh, for us to uh, adhere to in our lives. So everyone will be getting that along with an evaluation to fill out. Um, so you'll have something to take home uh, from today and you'll get that in about three to five days. And I wanna thank our uh, panel participants uh, very, very much for engaging um, so well uh, over this time. So I'll close now, thank you.